Good morning to all on this uh, Lord's Day, and uh, we are glad that uh, we are here. Uh, some of us might be not feeling good about the smoke, but uh, the, uh, it's the Lord's Day, and uh, we come to gather together to uh, nourish our souls. So we praise God that uh, we are still able to gather together to worship Him every Lord's Day such as this. So let us pray that this will continue and that the uh, epidemic will subside uh, so that uh, the restrictions will be lifted and we can worship um, to the fullest. Uh, one announcement that I'd like to highlight from the bulletin is that um, there will be a Saturday a Bible study, and this will be Romans 4 since uh, I will be gone uh, during the first Saturday of September. Also, uh, the church board has uh, received and accepted the transfer of membership of uh, Teresa Larson from the First Reformed Church in Yuba City. Uh, it's near Sacramento. And so let us extend to her our love and support with our fellowship and prayer. So can I ask uh, Teresa to stand so uh, everyone will recognize you. Thank you, and uh, we welcome you. Okay, let us uh, stand uh, for uh, silent prayer as preparation for worship. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of this day that uh, we have come to worship you. Uh, make our uh, Holy Spirit, uh, make the Holy Spirit uh, be with us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God calls us to worship with these words from Psalm 50. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my consecrated ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for God himself is judge. People of God, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. God greets us with this greeting this morning. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. O Lord, our Lord, we rejoice on this day, the Lord's day, the heavenly ordinance of rest, the open door of worship, the record of Jesus' resurrection, the seal of the Sabbath to come, the day when saints militant in the world and triumphant in heaven unite in endless song and prayer and praise of you. We bless you for the throne of grace that free favor reigns, that open access to it is through the blood of Jesus that the veil is torn aside and we can enter the most holy place and find you ready to hear, waiting to be gracious, inviting us to pour out our needs, encouraging our desires, promising to give more than we ask or think. Through Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us uh, sing our song of praise. The Mighty One, Our God, this is from uh, Psalm 50, and the tune is uh, Psalm 95a.
From uh, 1 Timothy verses 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. I mean, 8 to 11. Now we know that the law is good. If one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law has not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been Entrusted. And so, though we are not murderers or idolaters or unholy and profane, uh, and we are not sexually immoral, uh, we know that we come to uh, sin against God not only with our actions, but also with our words and thoughts. And so, God calls us to. Uh, repent, uh, confess our sins before him. So let us pray this corporate prayer of confession printed in our bulletin. O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to us. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us, open shame. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So to those of you who confess your sins with your whole heart, with contrite hearts, God promises us forgiveness all throughout the scriptures. And in 1 Peter 1, we read these words of assurance. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, this is the time of our exile in this world, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And so the Bible teaches us that those who confess and repent of our sins and have faith in Christ are ransomed or rescued from our sinful nature, from our sins, not with precious silver or gold, but with the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself for all our sins. So let us come to God in uh, prayer. So let us pray. O oh Lord our God, keep your servants that we may do no uh, evil to anyone this day. 
let it be your blessed will not to allow our enemy nor his wicked angels nor any of his evil members or our enemies to have any power to do us hurt or violence. Watch over us for good and not for evil and command your holy angels to pitch their tents around us for our defense and safety in our going out and coming in, as you have promised they should do for those who fear your name. We pray not also only for ourselves, but we beg you also to be merciful to your whole church, your chosen people, wherever they live upon the earth. Defend them from the rage and the tyranny of the devil, the world, and all those who hate you. Give your gospel a free and a joyful passage through the world for the conversion of those whom you have chosen. Bless the churches and communities we live in with peace, justice, righteousness, and true faith. We pray especially for our church here in Big Springs that we may always be nourished with your uh, word and spirit, that we may continue in the faith <clears throat> through all our sufferings and afflictions in this world, that we may uh, mature in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Comfort as many among us who are sick and comfortless in body or mind. Bless our country's leaders and increase them in them the gifts and spiritual graces which make them fit for those jobs to which you have appointed them. Direct the leaders of our country and our churches to lead the people in true faith, justice, obedience, unity, and peace. Hasten, O our Savior, the time of your return. Send forth your angels and let the dreadful, joyful trumpet sound. Do not delay, or the living could end up, give up their hope. Do not delay, or this earth could grow to be like hell, and your church be divided and be crumbled to dust. Do not delay, O Lord, or your enemies could take advantage of your flock, or pride, hypocrisy, sensuality, and unbelief could prevail against your remnants, your church, and when you come, you might not find faith on the earth. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We pray for those in our congregation and among our families and friends, the needy, the homeless, the elderly, the sick, the troubled, the grieving. In your wise and kind providence, you have appointed us for sickness or pain or afflictions in this age. We pray that you stay by them and others who are suffering, Lord. Keep their hearts in sweet recollection of you. That way, in the multitude of our hearts, sorrows, and bodily pain, your comforts may refresh our souls. We also pray for those who have been affected by the fires raging throughout our state. We pray for comfort and peace for those who have lost loved ones, homes, businesses, and farms. We also pray especially to keep the firefighters and other emergency responders safe in their difficult and dangerous work, and we thank them for their service. Hasten your coming, blessed Lord, and end these sinful days. Whether it be by our day of death or at the day of judgment, Lord Jesus, come when you will, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us now stand and sing our song of thanksgiving, number 138b, With Grateful Hearts, My Thanks I Bring. This is from Psalm 138.4.
you may all be seated. Today we continue with our studies on the Gospel of Mark. We are now in Mark chapter 12. Uh, before we read that text, I will read from a uh, few verses from Psalm 110. So Psalm 110 verses 1 to 3. And this is quoted by Jesus in our text in Mark 12. The word of the Lord from Psalm 110. The Lord, this is Yahweh, God the Father, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments, from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. So the first line says, The Lord, who is Yahweh, God the Father himself, says to my Lord. And this is a psalm of David, and David calls the other Lord, my Lord. And we will find that out, what he means in this line. The Lord says to my Lord. Then we go to Mark Chapter 12, <clears throat> verses uh, 13 to 14. So the word of the Lord from the Gospel of Mark, beginning with verse 13. <clears throat> and they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians, to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness the inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Verse 18. And the Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote, for us, that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason why you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribes said to him, you are right, teacher. 
You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Verse 36. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that that Christ is the son of David? David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. Verse 38. And in his teaching he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Thus far the reading of God's holy and inerrant word. Oh, let us pray. Lord, we have entered into your presence to hear you speak from heaven to us, to receive your reign and his spiritual due from your word, which never return in vain but ripen a harvest of grace that saves and nourishes our souls. Therefore, be pleased to reveal your Holy Spirit to us and to work in us that which you require. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear Congregation of Christ, Benjamin Franklin once said this popular saying, and probably you know um, this saying, In this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. But Steve Earle, a leftist singer, countered, the truth is you can not pay your taxes. I have done it, and there's no consequences, but it can be done. Death, you're not going to get out of, and you kind of got to deal with with it. So taxes had a great deal to do with the flames that started the Amerexit, not Brexit. Amerexit, commonly called the American War of Independence from the British colonizers. The Boston Tea Party had a lot to do with taxes on tea that was levied on tea purchased from England. The Stamp Act which taxed many transactions, also infuriated the colonists. In recent uh, decades, starting from the 1930s during the Great Depression, tax resistance movements have risen. In the 1960s and 1970s, they did not pay taxes because of the Vietnam War. These movements argue that income taxes are illegitimate, and taxes are voluntary, and they violate the Fifth Amendment. Whatever their reasons, many tax protesters have been fined or even jailed. In our text today, taxes are only one of three questions put forth by the enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ. They did not ask these questions sincerely to get answers but they asked merely to trap or test him. Our Lord answered their questions wisely and silenced them because from him comes all knowledge and wisdom of God. And so our theme today is Jesus wisely silences his enemies under three points. And you could follow the three points from your sermon notes. So, The first questioners were silent. Taxes to Caesar, that was their question. So the first group were the Pharisees and the Herodians. The Pharisees were legalists. 
believing that obeying the law of Moses and their own additions to the law made them righteous and pleasing before God. The Herodians were Jews who cooperated with the Roman occupiers for money and privilege, so they supported taxes. Matthew, you know, uh, as we know, uh, one of Jesus' 12 disciples used to be one of those hated tax collectors. So their trap question was, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? They thought that Jesus had no way out of this question. If he said yes, then they would charge him of supporting the Roman taxes. If he said no, he would be accused of teaching tax revolt. They even prefaced their question with a bogus praise of Jesus, saying he is a true teacher teaching God's law and not swayed by anyone's opinions or appearances. So Jesus knew their hypocrisy, but he did not say anything about this. Instead, he asked for a coin and asked them, you know, all coins have images uh, on two sides. <clears throat> he asked them whose image is imprinted on the coin. It was Caesar's. It was the king's image. So his answer to their trick question was, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. <clears throat> His enemies marveled or were amazed at him. More accurately, they were dumbfounded by his answer. So this teaching has three major applications, even to us today, especially the relationship between faith and culture, specifically between California's order banning churches from gathering indoors for worship. So in the last few weeks, Grace Community Church in LA and its pastor, John MacArthur, have openly defied this order, and they have been sued by the state. How does this action relate to Jesus' teaching about obeying Caesar? So the first application is that Christians are citizens of two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of men. We must obey the laws of both kingdoms, taxes and other duties as citizens of the kingdom of men, our nation. And we are to obey Christ's commandments as citizens of his kingdom. So we are subject to the civil authorities because they have been appointed by God, according to Romans 13, verses 1 and 2. Civil governments are established by God for that very purpose, so that society and nations will have civility and order, because God is a God of order. They are also God's surrogates for punishing evildoers and rewarding the good. Again, in Romans 13, verses 3 to 4. So second, although we are dual citizens, we should not mix the affairs of these two kingdoms. The church, the kingdom of God, must not meddle into the affairs of the state, the kingdom of men, and vice versa. In all of church history, when this distinction is violated, the results have been disastrous. In the medieval age, the church wielded the power of the sword, torturing and executing those whom they judge as heretics. Kings also had power over the church, influencing the appointments of popes, cardinals, bishops, and other church officers. So disaster came because of this mixing. Wars, torture, persecutions, and executions resulted in the mix-up of these two kingdoms. So third and last, and this application comes from Peter, is, <clears throat> there is, is there a point 
where Christians are allowed by scripture to obey, uh, disobey the laws of the kingdom of men. Certainly, in Acts 5, the apostles were arrested and imprisoned for preaching the gospel. But an angel of God freed them from prison, and they began preaching again in the temple. So they were rearrested, but they told the authorities in Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than men. And after, beaten, after being beaten, they were ordered to cease preaching. But as soon as they were released, they disobeyed the order again and began preaching again. The question for us today is, are we in an Acts 5.29 situation? And the short answer is no but I would qualify it with a not yet. No, not yet. Why? Though the authorities still allow us to worship outdoors and online, in our case, we worship indoors, there are signs that the civil authorities are slowly squeezing, squeezing the rights of Christians and churches. Our leftist state government is obviously anti-Christian and would do anything to silence Christians. We see this in its inconsistency, hypocrisy, and anti-Christian prejudice. While they prohibit indoor worship, they allow casinos, movie theaters, gyms, stores, and malls to open. They even allow screaming protesters, so-called, to gather in the thousands without any precautions. But churches cannot open. Our Constitution guarantees the freedoms of speech, religion, press, peaceful protest, and petition. And even the Bible says that these are allowed. Christians must be watchful that these freedoms are not violated by the authorities. So as we uphold our contract with the government, they, in turn, must keep their side of the bargain. So that was the first question about taxes. The second group of questioners were silenced about their question about marriage in heaven. So after the Pharisees and Herodians, there were the Sadducees. The sect of the Sadducees provided the high priests but they did not believe in the resurrection. They did not accept the whole Old Testament. They only accepted the law of Moses. They did not accept the prophets and the Psalms and the other writings of the Old Testament. Consequently, they did not believe in the resurrection because they said they did not find it in the law of Moses. And so they thought that if Jesus was not trapped by the question about paying taxes, their trick question would be impossible for him to get out of. So their hypothetical question involves a woman who was widowed not just once or twice or three times, but seven times. So they ask our Lord in verse 23, in the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For she had seven husbands. Their question was based on a conundrum, uh, which even God cannot solve. So if there is a resurrection, which man would God choose to be her husband in heaven? One out of the seven. So obviously, there would be no polygamy in heaven, just, just one husband. But she had seven on earth. So their question is based on the Old Testament law about what we term today as the kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer. So if a man died, uh, died childless, his brother or nearest relative has to marry his widow to continue his name, to continue his offspring. And so the firstborn 
by the kinsman redeemer through the widow would continue the dead man's name. So this we find in Deuteronomy 25. Boaz, and the ladies have been studying this, Boaz is an example of this kinsman redeemer. He married Ruth, and so the name of Ruth's husband who died would continue. And Ruth and Boaz, as we know, became the ancestors of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Sadducees were completely shamed by Jesus' answer. So first, he rebuked them. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. The Sadducees did not know the, their Scriptures because they only accepted the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Holy Scriptures before Christ came consisted of all the books from Genesis down to Malachi, the law of Moses, the prophets, and all the other writings. This is why they did not believe in the resurrection, uh, because the resurrection was found also in other books. Job 19, Isaiah 26, Daniel 12, Psalm 17, Psalm 116 for examples. In addition, they did not believe that God has the power to raise the dead from the grave, to give flesh and breath and life to even dry bones in Ezekiel 37. So if God is able to create the whole universe with a word from his mouth, why can he not create life and raise the dead to life? So Jesus condemns these people. You are wrong. Then Jesus pointed out their error, saying, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So when this present world ends and believers are in heaven, body and soul together, there will be no marriage relationships. And so this is a difficult thing for us, for all of us to accept. What about my wife or husband or children? Won't we have the same relationship in heaven? We can find a few, a few texts in the scripture about this doctrine. So first, marriage was created for companionship. It is not good for man alone. God saw it in Genesis 2.18. But in heaven, no one will be alone. For all believers will be together as one people, and they will all dwell with God and Christ forever. No one will be alone. Another purpose of marriage is for the procreation and perpetuation of believers, continuing the line. So third, marriage, marriage was established to prevent sexual immorality because of sin. In, in this world. But in heaven, there will be no illicit sexual desires. And fourth and last, all of these imply that not only will there be no funerals, because no one will die, but there will be no births and weddings in heaven, except for one wedding, which I will mention later. So how did Jesus prove the resurrection to the Sadducees. He cited a passage from their favorite uh, books of the law. Uh, it's uh, Exodus 3, verse 3, where uh, in, when the Lord showed, revealed himself in the burning bush, um, and uh, God, Moses asked him, Who are you? And the Lord said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God said, I am their God, not I was their God. And so they must still be alive even as they spoke. These forefathers and all those who died in the faith before and after them are still 
alive in heaven, waiting for the resurrection of their bodies to rejoin their souls in heaven, never to die again in eternity. So uh, the first question is about taxes. The second question is about marriage. And last, the last and third question is about what is the most important commandment? So it's, um, the third questioner is different from the first two. It was a scribe, a scholar of the law. So he asked Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered him in two parts. So the most important is loving the one true God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is from Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. And the second most important commandment is loving your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19, 18. Jesus did not say that the first commandment is the greatest, the second is the second greatest, and so forth. Rather, the whole law is summarized in the Ten Commandments. It is the most important commandments. The first four, com four commandments are about loving God. So the first four of the Ten Commandments. Loving God, who God is and how we are to worship and serve him wholeheartedly, not with empty rituals, empty words, and going through the motions. So the fifth through the tenth commandments are about loving our neighbor, how we are to honor, respect, be true, and have peace in all our human relationships. So in this prioritizing of the commandments, our priority is loving God with our whole being, our whole being, and loving our neighbor with the same love that we love ourselves flows from loving God. So if we do not love God wholeheartedly, how can we love our neighbor? All of God's commandments are about loving him and our neighbor. So if we find it difficult to obey God's law, about loving him, how can we obey his laws about loving our neighbor? Good works are the result of faith in Christ, and it follows from loving him. So in John 14, 15, Jesus says to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So the apostle John summarizes our Lord's teaching in 1 John 5, verses 2 to 3, he says, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. So the Apostle Paul elaborates this in Philippians 2, 3 to 4. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. He says, not only to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, but to love them more than we love ourselves. Count yourselves more significant, count others more significant than yourselves. And so this is a tall order. But if we love God with all our hearts, we are able to do this. So these three groups of questioners were silenced and stumped by Jesus' wise answers. So, in verse 34, after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So Jesus warned his hearers about the false teachings and the hypocrisy of the scribes and others who hated him their judgment will be great. So it was Jesus' turn to question the Pharisees in verse 37. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? So if the Messiah, the Messiah that the Jews believed in, if the Messiah or the Christ 
is the son of David. How can David himself call him my Lord? So he's only the son, but he is also the Lord of David. So the Pharisees, of course, did not know how to answer this. They cannot deny that Psalm 110, verse 1, is about the Messiah who will rule his enemies and whom King David calls my Lord. So therefore, the Messiah is both David's son and the son of God, fully man and fully God. It is not what the Pharisees and the other Jews thought that the Messiah will be just a human king who will free them from the Roman oppression. So the Messiah is both David's son and the son of God. So in hearing this teaching, his enemies were shocked while his followers rejoiced. So dear friends, the Roman emperors declared that they are divine kings worthy of worship. In the coin, in those days, it says, Caesar is Lord. But our Savior Jesus Christ is our only king, the king over all Caesars and authorities. Therefore, we must obey his commandments if we are to love our neighbor. But he has also commanded us to obey our earthly authorities, as long as their laws do not conflict with God's laws. So Jesus, the fruit of Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, became our kinsman redeemer. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We do not have fruits. We were formerly sinners who were spiritually dead, spiritually fruitless. The barren wife of the dead husband. But Christ redeemed us as our elder brother. As, he, as, as we await his return from heaven, let us remember that in heaven we will be the most beautiful bride adorned for her husband in splendor without any spot or blemish. And our Lord Jesus Christ will be our most handsome and majestic bridegroom forever. So both us, the bride of Christ, and Jesus, our bridegroom, will be celebrating our wedding feast in the heavenly places. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for revealing yourself and your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in your word. He is the treasure of true wisdom and knowledge. He is our king, so help us obey the commandments of his everlasting kingdom, and help us also to obey the commandments of our earthly kingdom, even if they are difficult or even wrong. For we know that our earthly kingdom will pass away, but the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ will pass, never pass away, will be forever. For in his precious name we pray. Amen.
receive now God's blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen.